Hello and welcome to another episode of Bite Size Steelers brought to you by Bite Size Sports. I'm your host, Simon Short. We are here to preview the week four matchup between the two and one Pittsburgh Steelers and the one and two Houston Texans. This game is at one o'clock on Sunday, October 1st at NRG Stadium in Houston. So another road game for the Pittsburgh Steelers, who will go down and face rookie quarterback C.J. Stroud. Let's go ahead and start off with the injury report for Sunday's game. Pittsburgh, relatively healthy. Two key players that are listed as out. Uh, offensive guard James Daniels and punter Presley Harvin the third. Harvin has had two of his best games of his career in weeks two and three so far this season. The team brought back punter Brad Wing, who punted for the team in 2014. And then he was with the Giants from 2015 to 2017. Didn't really play any professional uh, NFL, uh, professional football again until this past XFL season where he played for the San Antonio Brahmas, uh, coached by former Pittsburgh Steeler Heinz Ward. Um, so Presley Harvin is out. He's been dealing with a hamstring injury. He was on the injury report last week as well, but ended up going and having a good week three, but did not pra- uh, did not practice at all this week. So he is out for week four. Um, you have to feel good for Presley Harvin, though, and, and what he's done so far this season. If he had had a last couple of weeks like week one or maybe up and down like last season and he was hurt, you'd be worried about maybe his roster spot moving forward. But Wing is on the practice squad being elevated this week, I believe, um, as opposed to being on the 53. And Harvin hopefully is just out this one week and we'll see how Wing punts. Hopefully we won't see too many punts for Pittsburgh, but um, how that affects punt coverage and uh, field position for the Texans because Pittsburgh has and Presley Harvin has put a lot of offenses in bad positions inside the 20, inside the 10, inside the five over the last couple of weeks. So hopefully um, this does not affect the Steelers too much in this game against the Houston Texans uh, on the offensive line. James Daniels is out. Nate Herbig will start at right guard for the Steelers. Not as talented as James Daniels, but I do like Herbig's nastiness and toughness. Um, I think we can see the positive momentum for the running game continue with her big in the game. Not somebody I would necessarily, I'm not saying even if he has a good game and maybe this run game looks a little bit better, that doesn't mean James Daniels shouldn't start again, right? That doesn't mean her big is now the starter. What it means is this offense was already heading the right direction. The run game was heading in the right direction. Her big maybe gets everyone a little pumped up and brings that energy. But uh, Daniels is a, is a better player still. Um, but this is why you go and you spend $5 million on a backup guard because Pittsburgh for the first time in, I, I believe I saw from Alex Gazzaro of Steelers Depot, 20 games playing a backup or starting a backup in a game on the offensive line. Um, that is unusually fantastic health for offenses and offensive lines. Um, so it pays to have guys behind with some real experience. Her biggest start at 28 NFL games in his career between the Eagles and the Jets. Uh, the Jets last season, he started 11 games, and despite their woes on offense, they had a pretty good run game. Um, I'm excited to see her big play, and I'm excited to see what he can bring to the run game. So those are the only two guys out. Everyone else um, not only should be good to go, but was practicing in full by Friday. So you love to see that. So just two out for Pittsburgh in addition to the guys already on IR that we've talked about. Not the not the case for the Houston Texans, however. Actually, before I do that, let's go ahead and try to figure out our game day inactive. So uh, Mason Rudolph should be inactive again. James Daniels and Presley Harvin, as we just mentioned. Um, this should mean Dylan Cook gets a half for the first time this season, the offensive lineman. So maybe we see him at least get some special teams work, but it'll be good for him to get a hat and get to uh, prepare for the week as if he was going to be active. Um, Braden Fajoko, I expect to be sitting out of this one as well. If he wasn't playing last week and Josh Jacobs and that Raiders team, there's certainly no reason for him to play in this one. We'll we'll go over that um, as we as we go here. But if he's having a great week in practice, let's say an Armand Watts or Isaiah Loudermilk or maybe not giving what the coaching staff uh, what they want, then, yeah, we, we could see Foco. But I'm expecting Foco to be inactive again. And then I guess we're probably going to have two more spots. Um, so that'll be like, and that's because of the practice squad elevation for Brandon Wing. The punter, the one more guy has to be out. I do, I believe, if I have that right. Um, so that means 
let, let's say if that's not the case, it's one of these three guys. And if it is the case, it's two of these three guys. And that's Des Fitzpatrick, wide receiver, uh, Gunnar Olszewski, wide receiver, who uh, should be back and available for this game after the concussion last week. Um, and running back Godwin Iguabuque, uh, who was signed from the Atlanta Falcons practice squad last week. So let's say two of those guys need to sit. Um, Des Fitzpatrick is my is my mm, the guy I see as most likely to to sit. They elevated him. Uh, they signed him to the fifty three when John Deontay Johnson went to IR. He did not play last week, even though the team only played four wide receivers. Um, or, or I should say, the team elected to play four wide receivers instead of making Des Fitzpatrick active for this one for last week's game. I found that very interesting. So if only one of these three guys needs to be inactive, it's probably him. And then it comes down to Gunnar Olszewski and Godwin Iguipuque for um, uh, one more spot if the team has to keep two guys inactive, which I do believe is the case. And it could be Gunnar um, because they added Iguipuque when Gunnar was out. Iguipuque has not only running back experience as the team's real true third running back on the active roster as of right now, but he also has kick return experience. So he could be that that. He could be the team's starting kick returner for all we know. Gunner, obviously, before his injury, had the terrible kick return play where he caught the ball um, and went out of bounds, and he caught a ball that was going out of bounds. Um, so you would think, based on that and the way he lost the kick return job last season, he wouldn't be next in line. Now you could say because this team showed the confidence in Desmond King last week in his first game with the Steelers to be back there on kick returns. You make Gunner the backup. Uh, as the kick returner, you like what he does on offense. This team utilizes him on offense a little bit. So you you could very well say Gunner would be active over Iguibuque. But like we talked about last week or earlier this week in the recap episode, I should say, um, Mike Tomlin doesn't like to have defensive players back there as the kick returner too, too often. So maybe they had an eye on Iguibuque as this team's kick returner with Anthony McFarlane out. He came in midweek last week. Um, Desmond King had been with the team for a couple of weeks at that point. So that was just a one-week kind of holdover um, for, for Tomlin to do before giving Iguipuque the chance to be this team's kick returner. So it that's that's the, the tree I think it kind of falls down on. I, I think it starts with who's this team's starting kick returner. If it's Desmond King, then I think Gunner would probably be active. That would be – and it would start there. Who do they want as the kick returner? Um, because it's just easy to say – oh, well, whoever they make active, that's how you decide the kick return. No, I think it's the other way. I think it's going to be who they want to be the kick return. Do they want to be Desmond King for a few more weeks till McFarland is back? If so, then I think Gunner is active. If they specifically brought over Iguibuque to be the kick returner while McFarland is out, then obviously he gets the hat and Gunner would sit out. Gunner did not have, uh, obviously, the best uh, start to that game against the Browns before suffering the concussion. So, we will see what goes on there with the inactives. Let's move over to the Houston Texans, who have a much lengthier injury report. And for anyone not kind of keeping up with Houston, let, let's catch you up on at least the IR um, to start. So going on IR uh, in training camp uh, and preseason for the Houston Texans were the starting right tackle, Titus Howard, the starting left guard, Kenyon Green, second-year player, and the starting center, Scott Questenberry. Uh, then backup center Juice Scruggs went to IR still during the preseason. Wide receiver Noah Brown and defensive lineman Hassan Ridgeway, a couple of veterans, uh, went to IR after the first game of the season. And then second-year cornerback Derek Stingley went to IR two games into the season. So this team is just riddled with injuries so far. Out this week, not on IR, um, our starting left tackle Laramie Tunsil, who missed last week's game, Backup left tackle Josh Jones, who the team traded for uh, at cutdown time, uh, and played left tackle, I believe in the second game or in the third game. I believe he played left guard in the second game of the season. Um, so, so their first and second string left tackles are out. Um, starting Mike linebacker Denzel Perryman is out, and starting nickel corner to uh, Tavier Thomas is out as well. Um, so looking to start at left tackle, it's either going to be Austin Deculus, who has no career starts in the NFL, or Jerron Christian, who has 16 starts in the NFL, <clears throat> excuse me, and eight of those coming in 2021 while Laramie Tunsil was injured. Um, the safeties, on the other hand, should be healthy for this team. 
Um, Jimmy Ward, who was brought over from San Francisco, played in his first game of the season last week. And Jalen Petrie is uh, has no injury designation, or at least status designation, I should say. He had two full days of practice Thursday and Friday. He missed weeks two and three with a chest injury. So while they have some injuries at corner, their true starting safeties will be back in this one, uh, playing behind Steven Nelson, who we certainly know in Pittsburgh, um, as well as Shaq Griffin is going to probably be the other starting outside corner. And we'll get into the nickel corner here in a minute. Um, that is everything on the injury report. So let's hit the keys of the game. We're going to start with the offense. So now that Pittsburgh has started running the ball, uh, we mentioned in the recap show they broke the streak of, of first plays of the game without a run. Uh, I'll take a break from making that a key. We all know this team has to keep running the ball and run it more effectively each week if they want to uh, continue to win. So let's mix it up a little bit. First thing I want to do is attack those backup defensive backs. Uh, Steven Nelson is their top corner. He's been solid the last few years, even after leaving Pittsburgh. I believe in Houston, they play sides of the field with their corners. I don't think they have anyone follow. I'm not 100% sure on that, but I don't expect him to be following George Pickens around. Even if he does, you still have to feed the ball to Pickens where you, I want to I want to see Pickens line up in different places. I want to see him run different routes like he's been doing so far this season. And whoever's on him, keep feeding him the ball, sure. But let's, let's look to attack those backup uh, corners. See who you can get Calvin Austin lined up on and go after them, whether he's on the outside against Shaq Griffin, who we know is solid, but uh, he's on his third team now uh, in, in four seasons, I believe. He was cut by the Jaguars uh, over the course of the offseason. So if Calvin Austin's on the outside, let's see what we can do there. Um, and then Graylin Arnold is on his fourth year in the league, undrafted player, third year with the Texans. He is who is going to be playing the nickel position. Um, if you can get Austin line up on him, let's, I, I would definitely like to see that matchup attacked. Uh, Austin obviously has the big touchdown number of big plays this preseason and regular season. Let's utilize Calvin Austin's explosiveness. Those safeties are still working their way back. So maybe you can really hit them on a, on a busted coverage play with, uh, some communication issues or just one-on-one -on -one matchups for Calvin Austin. And then obviously, you know, continue to pepper Fryermuth and Robinson over the middle with that backup nickel on them. Uh, Fryermuth had a good game last week. Robinson continues to rack up the catches and first downs and, ju and just smart plays. So continue to attack the nickel position, especially with the backup in. But specifically, let's let's see what Calvin Austin can do in this one with a couple backup corners in the game. Second key, protect Pickett. Uh, there's a number of ways this can happen. Um, we know Kenny Pickett is starting to rear the ugly head of his pocket awareness and, and pocket movement uh, issues that he showed throughout his rookie season and throughout his time at Pitt. Um, we started to see some uh, started to see some improvements in that area in the week three game against the Raiders over the course of the game, particularly in the second half. But let's first start with with good protection for Pickett. Although he's only been sacked eight times on the season, which is just a little higher than the average so far this year, Pickett has been hurried 18 times and hit 15 times, both third in the league. Now, it's not just on the offensive line, although they've only been average at best, and now they have a backup guard in. But it's a play call. It's a receiver separation. And most importantly, it's a picket thing. I'd say receiver separation is probably the, the least of the issues among those four things. But let's just get... Good play calls, good route concepts. Um, Pickett continuing to throw the ball away when he needs to, continuing to move in good parts of the pocket, meaning climb up into the pocket or escape the pocket, which we'll get into. Luckily, though, Houston doesn't really blitz with D'Amico Ryans coming over from that mentality he had with the 49ers. It's all about rushing four. Um, so right now, uh, through the first three games and Thursday night football of this NFL season, Houston is 24th in the NFL in blitzes, 29th in sacks, 13th in QB hurries, 15th in QB knockdowns, and 19th in pressures. All that's by um, pro football reference. So this team isn't going to send a lot of blitzes. This team hasn't yet been that effective in terms of getting to the quarterback, especially finishing the play. You know, they're getting average number of hurries and, and knockdowns and pressures, but not necessarily getting sacks. They're not throwing a lot of blitzes. So let's just see this offensive line continue to hold up i mean five it's five on four for the most part so you know when, when your matchups give pick it plenty of time um and, and let's let's give some good play calls that create some quick easy open concepts uh for Pickett to read next 
uh, number three here, offensive key for the Steelers. I mentioned it briefly. Pickett scrambles. Um, Pickett had a couple scrambles in that in that Raiders area one, I think, in the Raiders game. Um, and this is something he needs to continue to do a little bit. We talked about him as a collective coming out of Pitt, where he won with his athleticism in college, and and part of my concern with that was he really only did that as you know a twenty two year old playing against 18 and 19 year olds, but we'll, we'll come off that subject for now. Um, but he does have athleticism. He's not a, he's not a pocket passer. That's not who he is. That's why he drifts in the pocket. And that's why he wants to extend the play, gets him in trouble a lot. Cause he doesn't necessarily have the arms or legs to be wholly effective in that, but it doesn't mean he can't scramble. We've seen it. We we've seen him get through, uh, get through the pocket, whether he's climbing at first or, you know, jetting out after one read to the outside. Um, I want to see Pickett continue to or start really scrambling. I'd like to see it, you know, two to three times in just this game. Uh, Pittsburgh or Pickett so far this season is in the bottom third of the league of quarterbacks in terms of scrambles. He has just two on the season. Uh, a little breakdown for you here: quarterbacks with ten plus scrambles so far this year. That's four. Four of the quarterbacks have done that. Six quarterbacks have scrambled seven to eight times. Twelve quarterbacks have scrambled four to six times. Meanwhile, 12 quarterbacks, which I think includes guys like Taysom Hill and, and Tyrod Taylor, um, have, have three or less scrambles so far this season. So among 12 quarterbacks, uh, which doesn't include those two guys I mentioned, um, so so guys who have really you know played and started games so far this season, uh, uh, there's 12 of those guys who have three or less scrambles. Pickett is 10th in passing success rate, 9th in completion percentage and 10th in adjusted yards per pass attempt. So among all the guys not really scrambling, right, uh, just sitting in the pocket and trying to throw the ball, Pickett's everybody, – almost everybody else is having better success throwing the ball than Kenny Pickett. He's, he's right in the middle in terms of touchdowns thrown, um, but in terms of you know play in and play out, having success, completing passes, gaining effective yards – through that, not taking uh, bad sacks, all those things kind of combined. Guys that are just sitting in the pocket trying to throw the ball, Pittsburgh or, or Pickett is at the bottom of the league in terms of passing success. So you would say, hey, you know, if he if Pickett's not really scrambling, maybe he's at least just doing really well in the pocket, and being effective. Well, we know just by watching that's not the case, but the stats back that back that up. Um, consistently, nine to ten quarterbacks who are not scrambling at all, just like Pickett are having far more success throwing the ball. Um, the guys behind them in these categories, just to give you an idea, Joe Burrow, who's playing on one leg right now, Andy Dalton, who is the backup for the Carolina Panthers, and Ryan Tannehill, who uh, Tennessee just put up three points against Cleveland Browns. Now, we know the Browns' defense is good, but this Titans' offense is not being is not being effective this season. That's not the company you want to keep. Andy Dalton, Ryan Tannehill, one leg Joe Burrow, and Kenny Pickett are the worst passers in the league in terms of guys who are not also scrambling. So Pickett's scrambling, uh, doing it. He's athletic enough to do it. Um, I would like to see him do it, and it'll help open up passing lanes. It could help him in his pocket awareness issues because if he drops back and he feels pressure, even if it's not there, which is something he does, knowing he can step up, knowing he can end up scrambling – might give him the confidence to step up in the pocket more. You know, if he's always trying to make a play and make a pass and in his head, he doesn't have the ability to scramble. He's more likely, I think, to drift back and think, let me drift back. Let me drift to the outside and try and extend this play, get away from the defensive lineman. But if he knows, hey, I can take off and run a little bit, that gives you a little more confidence to step up in the pocket and maneuver in there and try and find a gap to to wiggle away and and, and go for a run. Um, this doesn't mean it's going to be 20 yards, 15 yards, 25 yards every time, but scrambling for five to six yards even is obviously better than taking a sack and better than having to throw the ball away. Pickett has enough, uh, ability to do that. So I would like to see him scramble a little bit more, especially in this one. It might not carry over long-term once he proves he's willing to do it, but if it makes everything else that much easier because he shows he's willing to do it, I'm all for it. Let's flip over to the defense. Let, let's find three keys to this defense. Um, the Houston offense has gotten more production each week, scoring nine points, then 20 points, then 37 points so far this year. And they're doing it on the back of their rookie quarterback, CJ Stroud. So I heard this stat, I think, first from Ben Solak of the Ringer, but 
Uh, it's everywhere right now. Stroud has the third most yards for a rookie quarterback in their first three games of a, of their career, uh, 906, I believe. The run game, however, is poor, just 28th on the season in terms of yards. Both running backs are at 40% or less in success rate. Both are under four yards per carry. Um, and as a team, they are 30th in offensive rushing DVOA. So this team is having no success on the ground and having a bunch of backup uh, offensive linemen will do that too. So those running backs are Damian Pierce and Devin Singletary. Uh, so the Pittsburgh Steelers should focus all their attention on impacting C.J. Stroud and the passing offense, which is currently 11th in terms of passing offense DVOA, and it makes up 80% of their yardage on the season. Uh, at some point, make sure you guys are following me on Twitter at Simon underscore short. I'm going to I am going to compare that to the rest of the league. I didn't do that for this video. Um, but 80% of Houston's yardage this season is through the air. That that feels just out, outstanding. I mean, not necessarily in a good way, but um, just, just pretty incredible. So some keys to the offense. First, get to, get to C.J. Stroud. I mean, that's the easy one. This team has their third string left tackle, center, and left guard, who, by the way, is Kendra Green, formerly of the Pittsburgh Steelers. That should raise some eyebrows. Um, yeah, Stroud has taken 11 sacks so far this season. That's among the top in the league. He's fumbled the ball three times, and he's lost two of them. Meanwhile, Pittsburgh is tied with Detroit, who has played in Thursday night football. So they've played four games. Pittsburgh has played three. Pittsburgh is tied for the lead in the NFL with 13 sacks. TJ Watt leads the league individually with six. This is easy. I mean, get get after the quarterback. You might not even need to blitz. I, I haven't checked Steelers blitz numbers after week three compared to the rest of the league. But you might not even need to blitz. Rush for, get home, TJ Watt against... Um, George Fant, who's actually a pretty solid tackle, but he struggles with speed, especially then speed to power, which Watt is great at. But Alex Highsmith should have a big game in this one. I would, I, uh, Keanu Benton got his first career sack last week. I'd love to see that carry over, put him over Kendrick Green, and I think we know what could happen. Um, but but everybody, Montrevis Adams almost got a sack last week on a run play, which is incredible. Keep, keep this thing going. Uh, there should be four or five sacks in this one for the Steelers defense. Uh, next one, also pretty easy. Create turnovers off of those sacks and off of those pressures. Pittsburgh is 2-1, and one, yes, but splash plays are obviously a big part of that. Pittsburgh is tied for second in the league in takeaways with eight, four interceptions, and four fumble recoveries. As I mentioned, Stroud already has two fumbles. They should try to, they should at least get, I won't say try, or at least it would help them to get one more of those, right? Stroud has already shown that that that's an issue for him so far this season. Um, I think Pittsburgh needs one of those in this game. They need to keep that going. He also has not yet thrown an interception this season, despite that poor offensive line, which is really incredible. Stroud, a uh, brief tangent here on C.J. Stroud. Stroud was my number one quarterback coming into this past draft. He's making some big throws, man. He's making some really nice throws, standing in the pocket, um, delivering accurate balls you, with good timing, good anticipation, great reading the defense, good placement, all the things we knew about him coming out. Um I really, I really like C.J. Stroud, so it's going to be tough to watch uh, him on either end of the spectrum for Pittsburgh, either getting completely crushed or or dicing up Pittsburgh's defense. I'm not going to like that, but uh, tangent over. Uh, they uh, So Stroud has not thrown an interception yet this season. Like Jimmy Garoppolo last week, who had not taken a sack through the first two games of the season, it's time to end that streak for the Pittsburgh Steelers. They got to Garoppolo four times last week, um, giving him his first four sacks of the season. Give C.J. Stroud his first two interceptions of the season. You know, I think two interceptions and a fumble recovery all off of Stroud, not only creating splash for the defense, keeping points off the board, giving the offense advantageous situations, but getting in Stroud's head, putting him in a situation he hasn't been in yet as a rookie. I mean, I think he's a good quarterback, but rookies have rookie moments all the time. And, you know, if you give him his first game where he's turning the ball over a couple times, I could really shake him at least for this game. Um so I would like to see uh, some, some turnovers created by Pittsburgh, at least two, I think I think should be the goal. And that kind of comes from this last point I'm going to make, and it's better cornerback play. Last week, Devonta Adams and Jacoby Myers combined for 20 catches, 252 yards, and two touchdowns. That is insane. That is, that's crazy production. Houston's top two receivers, Nico Collins and Tank Dell. And not anything to that extent over the first three games of the season, but through three games, have a combined 30 catches for over 500 yards and three touchdowns. Considering Tank Dell is a rookie and Nico is a third-year player, I believe, um, 
that and and neither are really if you were to list your top 30 receivers in the league before the season started. I don't think either of these guys would have been mentioned, but um, two very, very uh, good young receivers who are developing good chemistry with Stroud. But Patrick Peterson and Levi Wallace should have their mojo back after week three, which is funny to say, considering all of those catches and yards that they gave up to Adams and Myers. But they're going to much younger corner or wide receivers that they're playing this season. They had three interceptions between the two of them, Wallace and Peterson, after last week, which is a real confidence boost for corners. Um, they should have their mojo back. They should be able to take advantage of these younger players, really get after them. Um, and if that pressure it's doing what it's supposed to do, they should be able to hang in there. Now, again, these are talented receivers. It's a talented quarterback. They're probably still going to get beat one or two times, but that needs to be m- way down from where it was uh, last week against the Raiders. So better cornerback play, which you know could look like interceptions, but really just not giving up a ton of yards, not giving up a ton of open catches, make things tough for the receivers. Um and continue to just kind of carry on that momentum with, from those three interceptions. So defensively, overall, just get after Stroud first, create some turnovers, have good cornerback play. Offensively, pick it, scramble the ball, protect himself and you know protect him in the pocket um, and, and attack those backup defensive backs. So again, kind of, kind of a nice book in there with the cornerback play. All right, that is your preview for Pittsburgh Steelers versus the Houston Texans. We will be back next week to recap the game. Thank you all so much. Make sure you are uh, subscribed to this YouTube channel. Make sure you're subscribed to this podcast on Spotify. Make sure you're listening to all the other Bite Size Sports uh, pods, including the other team pods. Uh, Thank you all so much for listening. Here we go.